Hey everybody, it's Dr. Mark Hyman. Welcome back to the Fat Summit, part two, where we separate even more fat from fiction. And I'm here to introduce you someone you probably already know really well right now, Dr. Carrie Dayulis. Now, when we decided to put together another Fat Summit, my team and I talked about having someone co-host the summit with me, and Carrie was the first person I thought of. Now, I've known her for a few years, but it feels like I've known her my entire life. I mean, she's so knowledgeable about functional medicine. She's one of the only female board certified orthopedic spine surgeons in the country. In fact, she's probably the only functional medicine orthopedic spine surgeon. And she uses a functional medicine approach to help her patients heal and get ready for surgery or to avoid surgery. She's one of the only surgeons who encourages people to choose alternatives to surgery when they can. And she's the medical director of an amazing clinical center called the Crystal Spine Clinic and Wellness Center in Ohio. Now you probably remember from the first FAT Summit that Carrie suffered from an autoimmune disease called type 1 diabetes. Now, she knows a lot about fat because of that. She knows a lot about diet and a lot about carbs, and she probably didn't want to learn those lessons, but she had to, and we're going to benefit from that. So I'm so happy to have Carrie here with me, co-hosting this with me, and welcome to the Fat Summit Part 2. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. So, um, you know, you've really been struck with this disease at a point in life which most people don't think you get this. This is what we call juvenile diabetes right. or, you know, kids diabetes. And you got nailed with this thing uh, when you were in your late 30s. Late 30s. And so um, it's kind of been a wake up call for you in a way. You were always focused on functional medicine, nutrition, but this made it really personal. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this and you've explained to me how you've been able to control your diabetes using very high fat diets. And in fact, your diabetes was so well controlled and your blood sugars were so low that the endocrinologist was gonna kick you out of his practice for keeping your blood sugars so well controlled because he thought they were too low, right? Can yeah. that be possible? <laughs> well, that wasn't me. That's friends of mine who are, you know, had that happen, but. Oh, I thought you said your endocrinologist was not happy. No, with they're your... not, yes, absolutely. That, you know, my A1C was too low. Yeah. So, which is sort of ridiculous. But um, yes, I was, you know, just to go back history wise in my 20s, I was about 100 pounds heavier than I am right now and sort of sorted through all that and lost that weight and was able to keep it off. And you were like a whole other person. I was a whole other person. <laughs> and so, you know, I was a practicing orthopedic spine surgeon and I was actually out talking about how to optimize patients with diabetes and obesity. Um, who type are two diabetes. type two diabetes, who are, you know, orthopedic patients about to have surgery or, you know, suffering from orthopedic related conditions. And I went for an executive physical. And before the physical was over, she called me back into the room and she said, there's something really unusual here. Your A1C is pretty elevated. And I was shocked. I said, that really can't be possible. I mean, I'm doing everything right. There were a few things extra sleep that I could get and stress reduction and things like that. And I thought I could, you know, had a few places that I could tweak my diet a little bit. So I did those things and I wasn't really able to get it controlled. And so then I started looking at, so originally I did a then lot of things. Then you called me. Then I called <laughs> you, right. And originally I was doing the things that are the more traditional, you know, advice, which is a low fat diet, very little meat, a lot of, you know, beans and lentils and things like that. And every time I would eat those things, my blood sugar would go through the roof. And it got to the point where... So eating whole grains and beans, mm -hmm. your blood sugars would just would, go crazy. Would just go crazy. And so then I said, well, this is not making sense. And I'm a scientist. And so if eating carbohydrate in any form raises my blood sugar, it clearly requires insulin. And... So I need to, and at this point they thought I was type two because it's you know fairly uncommon, although it's becoming much, much more they common. Call, they call it LADA now, late onset adult diabetes. Well, there's, yeah, autoimmune diabetes of adulthood and yeah. there's some different distinctions in that, but it effectively, you know, diabetes, there's two 
primary types, although there's some other subtypes. So there's really three primary types. There's type one, which is where the pancreas doesn't produce insulin, as you know. And there's type two, which is where the body becomes insulin resistant. And so can't utilize the sugar and you produce a ton of insulin. But then down the road, the pancreas gets tired and gets burnt out, and you can have people become sort of type one, type twos, although I for a like different reasons. Exactly. And then there's gestational diabetes and some of the less common types like MODI, which are um, a genetic type of, of diabetes. And so we still really weren't sure what type was going what on, had, yeah. what I had. But it made sense to me that eating sugar was, and not even sugar, but even whole grains was a bad idea because yeah. my blood sugar would go up. But, but the, basically the American Diabetes Association tells people to eat whole grains and beans right, which is to yeah. control their diabetes. Right. And what you're saying is you're type one and you really are super sensitive to any carbohydrate. Right. And probably type twos are too, I bet. For sure, I mean it's the, it, I like the term glucose intolerant. You know, we talk about, um, I, when I'm talking with patients about it, I'll say it's sort of similar to if you're allergic to peanuts. You know, I say carbohydrate intolerant. Right. Yeah. Saying that, you know, go ahead and eat the peanuts and inject yourself with epinephrine. Right. And that's sort of the same thing that we do with, you know, diabetes is we say eat the carbohydrates and there are medications. I actually had an endocrinologist say to me, just eat a cookie. Just eat a cookie. Just yeah. eat a cookie. And so I didn't. So I shifted my diet and I said, you know what? I've got to get rid of these beans. I can still keep eating the vegetables. But in the absence of carbohydrates, so, you know, there's three basic macronutrients. Yeah. There's protein, there's fat, and there's carbohydrate. And if you're dropping one of them, one of the other ones has to come up. So I, you know, played with fat and, and protein. And protein gets a little bit tricky at times because the body will convert through gluconeogenesis, which takes protein and converts it into sugar yeah. in the body. If too much protein gets converted into sugar. Exactly. And so protein needs some insulin as well, but fat is sort of insulin neutral. Yeah. And so I significantly increased the amount of fat that I was eating and, and what happened? moderated my protein and got rid of almost all carbohydrates. And for a while, at this point, we had determined that I was type 1 hmm. because my C-peptide was very, very low, which is classic like of type 1. a marker of insulin. Right, a yeah. marker yeah. of how much insulin. you're not really making insulin. Not really making insulin. And I was able and by to... By the way, you know, people who have type 2 diabetes, they make too much insulin. It just right. doesn't work. Exactly. And so I was able to stay off of insulin for a period of time because during what we call the honeymoon phase, but I was able to sort of prolong that because I wasn't stressing my pancreas because I wasn't eating carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And then, it went, then I got sick and you know got the flu, sort of the classic story, I got the flu mm -hmm. and then my blood sugars, it got much more difficult to control after yeah. that. So. Well, it's really fascinating, you know, type one diabetics, when they get diagnosed, they're typically losing weight. Right. They're hungry all the time. Right. They will eat like 10,000 calories in a day and they are losing weight. Right. So how could that be if you're like calories in, calories out, if it's all about energy balance, which is this dogma that the whole medical and nutritional establishment or government teaches us, right? Which is you should just eat less and exercise more. What if you're eating 10,000 calories and losing weight? Right. How does that work? Well, and I was eating quite a few calories before I added insulin, and then I can tell you as soon as I added insulin, I added 10 pounds along with it. Yep, that's the other thing that happens. Right. We know that when, when type 2 diabetics are uncontrolled and then doctors add insulin, they, they, the they first thing that happens, they gain weight. Right. Insulin is a fat fertilizer. And right. if you eat tons of calories, if you don't have any insulin, you can't gain weight. Right. Right. So, I mean, the same thing happens with kids and with type 1. So when you, in the absence of insulin, you don't store fat. You break fat down, which is why we produce ketones, because ketones are a marker of fat breakdown. And yeah. they can have a slightly different meaning in type 1 if they get too high. And yeah, you we're going to get into, we're the gonna get into that. But, but so you break down fat because your body doesn't have any ability to use any of the sugar that you're eating. So, so what's also fascinating is, is uh, you know, when you look at, as we said, type one diabetics, mm -hmm. like if, if you don't have insulin, you can't gain weight. But if you're a type two diabetic, some of the studies now are looking at using ketogenic diets mm -hmm. to actually reduce the uh, need for insulin or in fact reverse insulin. I mean, we've seen people get off 100 units of insulin right. in a week by dramatically changing their diets. And I'm not sure if you saw this study, but it came out uh, just recently, it was in mice, which still has to be proven, but it showed that 
using ketogenic diets in mice, they could reverse kidney failure. Yep. These are like little mice that are on dialysis, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think it was and a 2011 study that showed that. Yeah. It was, just came out, I thought. And then, or maybe it was 2011, but it yeah. was like, I'm like, wow, if this is true, this is revolutionizing medicine, right? If you imagine if you take all the people on dialysis, how much that's costing, how much suffering they have, and put them on these high fat diets. And by the way, most, most people on dialysis are there because they have diabetes. Right, or hypertension, that's the other. Which is yeah. caused by insulin resistance. Right, <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, there are, you know, more and more studies that are coming out that are showing that for type 2s, low-carbohydrate diets can significantly decrease people's blood sugars, decrease their A1C, and get them off of some of the medications that yeah. they're on. Um, you know, one of the controversial things is that, you know, there was a study that came out a number of years ago looking at tight control of diabetes. And they looked at using medicines for intensive control. Yeah. And yeah. what they found was that there were actually more complications in those who had intensive control until you actually went down and looked at it. And the people who had those increasing complications were the ones who had, had longer, higher blood sugars. And so people will often push back and say that a type 1 or type 2 diabetic can't have a hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of the amount of sugar that's sticking to the red blood cells, that they can't have it in a normal range because they're diabetic. And that's just ridiculous to me because I have an Yours A1C. Yours are lower than mine, and I'm not diabetic. <laughs> there you go. I mean, and again, it has a lot to do What's with the yours? fact that um, my last one was 4.9. See, mine's 5.4. See? There you go. See, you, you, I must eat worse than you, or maybe I should get you know more more information from you on what to eat. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, there is almost nobody who has that kind of control. Period. I mean, I rarely see a hemoglobin A1C of 4.9, and it's probably because you're eating such a low carb diet carb and diet. high fat diet. And you know that also takes away your hunger. It gives you more energy. It makes your brain work better. Your brain already worked pretty good, but it's pretty impressive, your brain. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an amazing strategy, which I think you're now actually beginning to study, right? You're working with David Ludwig from mm -hmm. Harvard. And you know, David told me, by the way, he's a friend of ours, he told me if, if you, uh, you know, had somebody drink 10,000 calories of olive oil a day, mm -hmm. they wouldn't gain weight. And if that's all they ate, that wouldn't gain weight because you wouldn't make insulin when you eat fat. So you don't make insulin when you eat fat. When you eat fat. And if I eat just fat, then I don't need to give myself any insulin. So that was my sort of first, you know, eye-opening experience with this is I would eat a breakfast of just fat. And if I had that, I could actually operate the entire day. My blood sugars were stable and I didn't need to give myself any of the insulin that goes along with a meal. If I eat carbohydrate, I need to give myself insulin. And, you know, that's the really tricky part. And this is the thing that gets really frustrating is, you know, the ADA says things like eat 30 grams of carbohydrates per meal or more. And the problem is, is, you know, I have an advanced degree and was a biochemist and I can't. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> look, look at an apple right. and say exactly how many grams of carbohydrates are in it to match it with insulin. And so it's this roller coaster that you're on. And it's fairly miserable. And you feel bad when you're too high, you yeah. feel bad when you're too low. You know, one thing people may be wondering about is like, they go, well, wait a minute, isn't carbohydrate an essential nutrient? And actually, what we know is that there's essential fats, right? There's essential amino acids, right? from protein, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, like humans don't need carbohydrates, carbohydrates. to live. Yeah, and the brain can function just fine on Ketones, maybe which better. is maybe better. Yeah, I mean, because we're now looking at that in Alzheimer's right. and autism and brain cancer and right. epilepsy. The brain actually does better on these ketones. And we do need some insulin to live. You know, if I don't have some doses of insulin, then you know our bodies don't function. And or, you know, originally, so this is the interesting history of diabetes. Is you know, originally before insulin was discovered by an orthopedic surgeon, by the way. Really? Um, yeah. Banting? Was it? Yeah, it was orthopedic surgeon. Really? And so originally when it was, or an orthopedic specialist, I'm not sure that he was right. a surgeon. But um, prior to that, the Joslin's diet and Allen's diet were all very low carbohydrate. Yeah, they were 70% and... fat. Exactly. And, you know, they were able to maintain people for, you know, granted it was not particularly long periods of time mm -hmm. who were type 1 diabetics, but mm -hmm. for a lot longer than what they would without, yeah. you know, with, with funny, having yeah. a regular diet. I mean, it's so funny that, you know, 
the, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center is named after a guy who actually created a diet that was 70% fat, fat to treat diabetics. Now there's a guy who's going to be in the fat summit, Dr. Hamdi, Osama Hamdi uh -huh, from Harvard, yep. who runs the obesity program there and the diabetes program. He's actually using high fat diets yep. in his patients to treat and reverse di type 2 diabetes. Yeah, he does a phenomenal job of going through the history of how diabetes has been treated. And it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating how we've swung. And it's sort of akin to what we've been talking about a lot in the Fat Summit with going from a low-fat diet and recommendations to, you know, the pendulum swinging to there being benefit from a higher-fat diet. And it's not always, you know, I still play with it now. You know, there's not one particular level that we've dialed into. You know, that was one of the things that um, Amy Myers and I talked about earlier in our interviews was that, you know, it's not one size fits all. And so there are times uh -huh. during this where I tried upwards of 85% wow. fat. And, you know, now I've sort of dialed it down right now. What seems to work really well for me is about 60% fat, 30% protein, and 10% carbohydrate. 10%. So, so what does that look like in a day for you? Um, you know, usually I'll have, right now I'm doing some sort of ground turkey for breakfast with um, a, a non-starchy vegetable. Like, I actually like uh, yicama root, which is That's a crunchy. prebiotic, and it's yeah. crunchy, and it's got a little bit of sweetness to it. Yeah. Um, and so I give myself a small amount of insulin That's for a that. Treat. You have a yeah. your sugar. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then for lunch, I'll have some, you know, chicken with a whole you know, two cups of roasted vegetables and then so you can just pick out on the vegetables i eat the non-starchy vegetables right. i eat you know although i have to be careful with some things like brussels sprouts and things like that just to measure the carbohydrates in them because there are some carbohydrates that i do have to mm. you know dose insulin for but it's so much easier to do now mm. so you know if i eat grapes or something like that my blood sugar shoots up and then it's you know i'm chasing it down and you know it's yeah. trying to not go too low because there's that thing where insulin keeps us alive, but yeah, yeah. too much can kill you. <laughs> and then, and then, what's for dinner then? Um, you know, we do a lot of different things around the house. I have little kids, so you know, I eat salmon, wild caught salmon, a lot with another, you know, plate full of vegetables. And that's what you fed me when I came over for dinner. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, in fact, I think it was the recipe out of the book. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's common. But you know, for our family, you know, we have, we almost always have some sort of, of healthy, you know, animal sourced protein and then a lot of vegetables and the kids get to pick and choose from that. And we do let the kids have options where, you know, our house, we've got celiacs in the house, so mm -hmm. we tend to be more gluten free with things, but. So, so in terms of like the fats that you eat, mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you, do you want to talk about like some of the, the things that are controversial, like vegetable oils? Cause I think there's, you know, there's a paper published a couple weeks ago in JAMA where it showed that uh, looking at total fat, mm -hmm. there was really no link to, to death, right? It was an inverse relationship. The more carbs you ate, the more you died. The more fat you ate, the more you lived. But when they looked at the different kinds of fat, they showed that the ones who were eating the polyunsaturated fats, even the omega-6s and the right. olive oil, did better than the ones eating saturated fat and omega-3 fats. I mean, the, the saturated fat and trans fat. So um, what do you think about all that research? So the first thing is, is that trans fats, I don't think there's any controversy at this point that trans fats are just toxic for our bodies. Our bodies can't handle them and we just need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's, the jury's out on that one. Um, but as far as, you know, the seed oils and the issue is our diets have become really, really high in omega-6 and very, very low in omega-3. And if we look at the pathways, and uh, you know, a lot of this can be linked to some of the chronic pain that we're seeing as well. So omega-6 through the arachidonic acid pathway becomes, uh, it's a pro-inflammatory type um, of a fat. Mm -hmm. Whereas omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory type fat. And so the way I describe it to patients when I'm talking about it is omega-6 is more like the gas on the car yeah. and the omega-3 is the brakes. Yeah. And we have to have both. You can't drive a car sure. without both of them. So if you're exposed to a virus, you need the inflammatory response. Or if you get an injury, you need you that need inflammatory that, right. response. It's but like Goldilocks. You, also, you just want the right amount. You just want the right amount. 
And so what's interesting is things like aspirin. Aspirin, so the, the one enzyme that they both are impacted by is the cyclooxygenase, cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme. And depending on which fat goes through that pathway, whether it becomes pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Yeah. When you take aspirin, you actually acetylate that protein. And the other anti-inflammatories don't do this. And so aspirin, uh, an acetylated COX-2 enzyme in the presence of omega-6 fat can have anti-inflammatory end products. Yeah. And so this is one of the reasons where aspirin can play in and where aspirin so can be, be beneficial. For some people it can be ben beneficial, you know, and that's one of the tools that I use when I'm seeing a patient who is having, you know, pain is we want to turn down all the inflammation. So as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm basically a construction worker. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I'm in the operating room, but when I'm seeing a patient in clinic, there's a lot of other things that we can do. And so most of my focus is how do we get rid of the inflammation? And, you know, then other things like balancing out so, muscle So what, the study basically showed that you should, we should all be eating more omega-6 fats. So like, the, and that they were preventing disease and death. Because so, uh, to me it right. was like it was an interesting study, but it was also observational. Like it didn't right. really prove cause and effect. And uh, there are other studies that show that are randomized controlled trials that actually it may not be so good for you. Like right. the it's Minnesota coronary experiment where they looked at 9,000 people and they gave half of them butter and half of them corn oil, which is an omega-6 fat, and the corn oil people did worse. They died right. more and they had lower cholesterol, but it actually didn't help them. Yeah, and there's other studies, you know, looking at inflammation. So this one was in another mouse model, but mm. they took mice and they simulated a spinal cord injury with the inflammation that happens around that. And they did this study where they had the mice run on um, balance beams and they counted the number of foot faults. So whenever a spinal cord in is injured in the cervical spine, it creates something called myelopathy and you get gait abnormalities. Yeah. So they can't keep their balance. And what they found is they gave high dose omega-3 and curcumin, which is an anti-inflammatory. So they wow. did two things together. Um, and what they found was that the mice that had the high dose omega-3 and the curcumin had many, many fewer foot faults than the mice that ate a, the regular mouse chow. So, you know, we don't have studies like that in humans, but, you know, from the pathways, we do know that the omega-3 fats have anti-inflammatory properties. Mm -hmm. So the tricky part really is, is how much omega-6 is yeah, appropriate much, in yeah. our diet. I mean, should we, should we have vegetable oil in our cover? Do we, do we eat it? I mean, should we put soybean oil in our cover, corn oil, canola oil? you know, safflower oil, sunflower oil, these oils. So none of those are on my show. So those in your <laughs> cupboard, like I said, they're not in my cupboard. They're not. You know, because Olive oil. Olive oil, right. coconut oil. Coconut oil, ghee, ghee we use because of the butyrate. Like that's butter, in it. but yep. without the dairy part in it. Right. Right? Yeah. With the dairy fat. Exactly. Right? So and those are the fats that we cook with right. in my house. And yeah. I think, you know, that's what my kitchen looks like. And I think when I read the literature, think about it, you know, when we look at the way we used to consume fats, it was butter, lard, tallow, right? Right. Olive oil. We'd have some nuts and seeds, right? But that was it. We didn't have refined vegetables. I mean, we've had a thousand percent increase in a thousandfold increase in our consumption of soybean oil. It's now ten percent of our calories, right? Which we never had before, and it doesn't seem to make sense from an evolutionary point of view. It doesn't pass the sniff test for me. And when you look at the data from these guys like Hiblin, they, they found that the high levels of these omega-6 fats Jesus. were linked to more homicide, suicide, violence, as well as all kinds of other chronic diseases and mortality. So I think, I think there's, there's a big split in the scientific community of those who think that omega-6 fats are the cat's you know, meow and we should all be drinking them and having them all day long, and others who think that the data doesn't support that. And I'm sort of, you know, concerned about it. And I think, you know, just from an evolutionary point of view, I, I'm not a big fan of eating a lot of omega-6s except mm -hmm. in food. Like if you have nuts, if you have right. seeds, eat sunflowers, right? Eat soybeans, right. eat, you know, corn, right. but don't eat the oils that are extracted from them. Right. And again, the extraction process for a lot of those seed oils is fairly intensive, you know, in order to get those out. So there are other byproducts that, you know, can be a factor in that as well. Whereas, you know, the, the, more the other oils that we're talking about, it's a much yeah, more there's, straightforward there's, there's process. Yeah, there's solvents, there's hexane, right. there's yep. deodorizers, there's chemical processes that they go through that right. it's not exactly a very 
I mean, and even Good coconut process. oil, you can get refined coconut oil, and that's something that's not on my shelf either at mm -hmm. my house because, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the, the yeah. less processed it is, mm -hmm. is something that I'm more interested yeah, in. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I was talking to Dr. Hiblin, I don't think mm -hmm. I told you about this, but he told me that the, the cholesterol that you have, mm -hmm. you know, inside of the cholesterol are the fats, right, that you eat. Right. So, or that you make. So saturated fat makes your cholesterol very stable. Right. And not likely to be oxidized. Whereas the omega-6 fats, the linoleic acid, gets inside the cholesterol and becomes unstable. It's more likely to get rancid, mm -hmm. which is actually what causes heart attacks. It's called oxlams, oxidized linoleic acid mm -hmm. metabolites. And this is a real thing, and most people don't know about it. So we think all the, you know, as long as the LDL is lowered when you drink omega-6 oils, that's a good thing. Right. Not necessarily. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is again, you know, not scientifically based, but my grandmother lived to be three weeks shy of 100 and she ate butter and lard. I mean, she cooked pies, but yeah. she made them with lard. Well, it's interesting, yeah. you know, a lot, of, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, we've eaten more fat and we've eaten more meat and that's why we're all sick. But when you look at the data, and I looked at the data from the USDA, from the records of what Americans are eating, our butter consumption, our tar, tallow, lard consumption, our egg consumption, our red meat consumption has gone down dramatically in right. the last hundred years because everybody thinks it's bad for you. Right. right? Chicken, I think, but went chicken up. Chicken went up, which is, by the way, full of omega-6 fats because right. they eat grains which have these and seeds which have these omega-6 oils. Right. They're not eating grubs running around the field. And also, um, they, they, uh, the, the, the increase in the oils we're eating is vegetable oil. It's not butter. Right. So, yeah, the reason I think we're sicker and fatter is partly because we're eating more of the wrong foods and not the right foods. I mean, did you right. see that article, Is Butter Back? Did you see that recently? I it did. Was, I did. Yeah, it was like a, it was like a, a review of nine studies, mm -hmm. 600,000 people. It was like six and a half million people years. And they looked for correlations between people who eat butter right. and people who had disease. And they found that those who had the butter there was no increase in heart disease, and there was an inverse relationship with diabetes. So people well, literally who had butter in their in their diet had lower levels of diabetes. Well, and some of that may be from the butyrate that's in butter mm -hmm. and the way that it's, it interacts with the microbiome. So, and- Well, now you're talking about language. Poop. <laughs> <laughs> I like poop. Right. So, so normally, you know, if we eat a diet that's high in fiber, um, the healthy bacteria in the GI tract, as you know, will make butyrate and butyrate, you know, higher levels of butyrate for many different reasons. You know, there's mm -hmm. several different reasons why it works. Um, one is acting directly at the mitochondrial level mm -hmm. in addition to at the GI, you know, mm -hmm. membrane wall level. Mm -hmm. um, improves metabolic syndrome, so, or improves a patient's metabolic status impacts their insulin sensitivity. So, you know, they've, there are some studies where they've supplemented with butyrate and have seen some of the similar responses. And some of these have been in animal studies and they're starting to look at it in human studies. But part of the reason why, you know, butter may be for some people a benefit is because of the butyrate that's in it. Um, I have, you know, in my patient population, because I sort of see, you know, I have some selection bias, obviously, but I see people with, you know, significant pain and a lot of it's chronic pain. Mm -hmm. I have to get the, the casein and whey out because yeah. people tend to be yeah, sensitive be to, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. I think that's true. So ghee is good. So ghee now, I, mean, I, I remember when I reviewed that study for my book, uh, that was a lot of, very controversial study that looked at 72 studies. It was, I think, uh, 600,000 people, mm -hmm. 19 countries, and some of them were plasma fat level. So they actually looked at the blood right. of people and they measured the fatty acids and the kind of fats that were in their blood. Right. And what was fascinating, when I looked at the graph and I saw what was sort of mapping out, there's not just one thing that's called saturated fat. Right. There are many no. kinds. The kind in coconut's different than the kind in butter that's different than the kind in meat that's different than the kind in, you know, whatever. So, so And for all of these, even omega-6s, there are different omega-6s, there are right. different omega-3s. It's not simple and straightforward. Exactly. Right. Well, that's why I wrote a book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that, what was fascinating was that when you look at the graph, the only ones that showed seemed to show benefit were the ones that most of the saturated fats were neutral, but the ones that showed benefit were the dairy fats, mm -hmm. like basically butter. Right. Well, blood. there was just a recent study that came out that showed that that, you know, increased level of dairy fat in the blood was associated with, you know, 
fewer medical problems, effectively. Yeah, yeah no, this was like, a, I think, the diabetes right. study. Yeah. And they, they was 3,000 people, 15 years, and they looked at blood levels of basically butter, mm -hmm. and the ones who had the highest levels of butter in their blood had a 40 to 50% reduction in type 2 diabetes, right. which is borne out in this other study. So it's very fascinating to me how that works, and I think that, that we don't exactly know the mechanisms, but... You know, I, 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 we did one of the interviews with Dr. Ron Krauss, and he's a mm -hmm. very humble guy, but he, you know, he basically is one of the pioneers in breaking down this stereotype of saturated fat being the bad guy. And you know, do you, do you use ghee in your diet, right? I do, I use ghee, we cook with ghee, um, and you know, there, I think that there are some definite benefits to ghee. We're not, you know, from my standpoint, I do think there are some people who have to be careful with saturated fat, but I think in the absence of sugars, saturated fat for a lot of people can be neutral. So, you know, and that's where looking at how your body responds to things. I mean, mm -hmm. that's sort of what I do with myself and what I do with mm -hmm. patients is we try something and then we measure blood levels and we see where if we're moving in the right direction and then we do something simple and say, how do you feel? Right. right, because that's your first indicator that things are either working well or not working it's well. It's how people feel. It's how people feel because when you get them sort of on the right track, they'll feel better. Yeah. And you know, I can tell you, I mean, I was vegan for a very long Ooh. time and, you know, and was low fat vegan. And I, st I struggled with keeping weight off. So you my were gaining hair weight. Was, I was gaining weight. My hair was falling out. My, you know, menstrual cycles were all messed up. Like it wasn't good. I was trying to run, you know. fat and bald. And fat, your, yeah, yeah. And I was running. Your screwed up. Exactly. <laughs> Not something you want to be. And, you know, I was running a lot and, you know, the whole calories in, calories out. So I had to keep running more and more and more to keep my weight stable. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until, you know, ultimately I added more fats back in my diet. That so, so that's amazing. You know, did you, did you hear about that uh, recent ruling in Italy where no. they, they had a, passed a law that parents if they put their kids on a vegan diet before three years old, they would put them in jail for two oh, years? Oh, wow, no, I hadn't heard that. What yeah. do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Because these kids were coming in malnourished and they're right. deficient iron and vitamin D and zinc and omega-3 fats. and. I mean, here's the thing. I think that we can be healthy on a variety of diets. The issue is, you know, vegan can mean a lot of different mm -hmm. things. Chips and, and Coke. Exactly, chips and Coke, right? And, you know, I know a lot of vegans who don't actually eat many vegetables. Yeah. So, you know, it's very different if you're, <laughs> if you're eating a vegan diet that's avocados and coconut butter and coconut oil and nuts and seeds as opposed to, you know, carrots plain by themselves and, you know, potatoes and you know mm -hmm. all of those things that mm -hmm. you know even the beans i mean beans get tricky for some people again mm -hmm. the beans I, people it's interesting when you told me how you eat beans or I, eat then grains, my blood or sugar goes fruit, hot yeah which we all think is healthy right. it, it really has a big impact on your blood sugar for sure i mean it's got you know at the end of the day the amount of carbohydrate that is in it whether it's absorbed slowly or over a long period of time it, as a type one i have to cover that with insulin Mm -hmm. So as a type two, if it's covered slowly over time, they may not see the spike because of phase one versus phase two insulin release and they mm -hmm. can keep up, mm -hmm. but it's still needing to be matched with insulin. Yeah, that's true. I remember I, I gave um, a talk at your daughter's school and, uh, and there was a woman who got up and she said, oh. she said you know, I'm diabetic. Right. Um, I had a heart attack. Right. And I went on Dr. Esselstyn's program which is very low fat vegan diet, like no nuts, no avocados, no olive oil, nothing. And she says, I got another heart attack and I can't keep my blood sugar in control. Right, no, I mean, it's, and that was you know my experience, but I have that with patients. That's one of the things, the first thing that I do when I see a patient who has metabolic syndrome, it's you like know, pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes or, you know, I kind of lump all those metabolic syndromes. Type 2 diabetes is on the spectrum of metabolic yeah. you know, syndrome. And so the first thing that I do is we talk about, okay, let's get the carbohydrate out for a period of time. And, you know, when you get the carbohydrate out and you keep the protein relatively stable, then the only thing you can do is increase fat. And a lot of people are really sort of fearful of that. I mean, I know for me it was a big deal because I was scared that I was, you know, I sort of have this little thing like there's this hundred extra pounds that could like come back on me like that. 
And so there was a fear of what happens if I start eating all of this fat. And right. it was fine. Right. And you, so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I people are so afraid. Time. It's true. Yeah. I mean, people are afraid of avocados. It's right. crazy. Like, no, I was. I mean, it that's was. That's fattening. That was Don't on my no foods. Nuts. Yeah. They're fattening. Nuts are fattening because there's all this fat in them. I mean, it's such a paradigm shift for right. people, right? And well, and I think the the um, guy who just won the Tour de France was is a, a low carb, higher fat diet. Well, let's and talk about that because you're an athlete, right? And I think you know what's fascinating to me is you know for years we were trained have that big bowl of right. pasta before a race, you know, right. carb load, right? And then you need carbohydrates for energy and fuel. I remember I rode my bike from Boston to New York, and all I did was eat power bars, which way. are like pure sugar the right. whole way and I, think, I lived on them I mean they're so bad right because they're low fat yeah low right? fat high sugar right give you quick energy right. so what is the deal with people who want to be athletes and they think they need carbs to do high performance athletics what's the story with so that? Jeff Volick has done a ton of excellent he's work in Ohio. this area yes um, he's in Columbus right now at Ohio State you know so he's really looked at a lot of this but uh, most of the science that he wrote a book with the art of low carbohydrate performance performance right? yeah. yep and it's a great book I really encourage people to to consider to go out and get that book if they're looking at doing this but you know the ultimately our body it be, can become keto adapted to where our muscles and our brain can use fats for fuel. Mm -hmm. And so our body stores sugars, but we store a very limited number of sugars yeah. that we can utilize. About 2,500 calories. Exactly. So a, you know. when you're doing an endurance type sport, like a marathon or an Ironman or something like that, you get to a point, we called it bonking, where you're out and you were just done. You couldn't you know, you had utilized your glycogen stores and you were finished. And every athlete who has experienced that knows what I'm talking about. Bonking. Bonking. <laughs> Whereas when your body, when you exercise on fat, when your body is, when the mechanisms are in place for your body to utilize those fats, the amount of carbohydrate that you need for that goes down dramatically. So it sort of reserves that. And you have this almost unlimited source depending on how much yeah, I mean, body fat you have. you might have 2,500 calories of carbs in your body stored, but you right. might have tens of thousands of calories of fat. Right, I mean, it's really hard to burn through all of that in the period of what you can do in a day, mm -hmm. right? Um, even with some of these endurance sports. And you do have to, you know, eat some carbohydrate. I mean, I can tell you the thing that happens with me that's interesting is my body has gotten so efficient at burning fat when I exercise that if I do a high intensity, my blood sugar will go up and I'll actually, my body just, you know, unless I give myself insulin, it's not Why utilizing it. So adrenaline causes then release of sugar uh -huh. and without insulin to match it, it doesn't get utilized, but I'm out running and feeling just fine because my body's functioning on fat. It's actually not using the sugar. Right. So, you know, I don't need to give myself extra insulin, although, you know, then I need, if there has been a spike from an adrenaline release, then I do need to usually cover that with a little bit of insulin mm. at the end, so. So, uh, what, 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 tell me about this study with the, uh, the type 1 diabetics. What are, you, what are you hoping to find? So, Dr. Richard Bernstein is an endocrinologist who's a type 1 diabetic himself. Um, we're actually interviewing him as part of the Fat Summit coming up. And he, um, has been a strong proponent of a low carbohydrate diet for type 1 diabetics for a long time. And that's the way he's managed his diabetes. He's in his 80s now. Amazing. And, Which, yeah. Right, has no complications related to type 1 diabetes. Unbelievable. And he was diagnosed as a small child. And so, you know, we get deeper into his story. Um, but a whole group, so he's written a book called The Diabetes Solution, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. And there's a whole group of people who, parents of children and adults with type 1 diabetes, either they had it as a child or they were diagnosed as an adult, who've read his book, who've sort of come together in this Facebook community. Yeah. And so, you know, David and I looked at this and we said, there's this whole group that we can study because there's this fear about type 1 diabetics being on a diet that produces ketones. ketones. Yeah. Right. So because that's what diabetics can die. Right. Of, so right. ketoacidosis is something that kills diabetics, but so do you know really low blood sugars, hypoglycemia, and so you know one of the things that that David was really interested in is showing that there's this group 
of type 1 diabetics who are managing it on a very low carbohydrate diet and there are different insulin strategies for doing that and that a lot of people can have normal blood sugars and so yeah, perfectly normal perf yes so you know we're looking at this whole group through a survey and trying to you know to just demonstrate that this is something valid we're studying and then from there we can go on and this do is revolutionary, more right? randomized controlled trials. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of people who I know who have shown letters where their endocrinologist dismissed them from their practice, as we talked about earlier, because they were not feeding their child enough carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Now the kids are growing, the kids are yeah. thriving. Well, that's, you know, it's interesting. That's what we're, we're trying to do at Cleveland Clinic is mm -hmm. do some research looking at how we can get type 2 diabetics off of insulin. And, you know, most physicians don't see that. They don't see right. that in three days or four days or a week. People can get off 50 or 100 units of insulin. It's just impossible. But we know it happens all the time. If you have bariatric surgery, right. you know, you can actually get off insulin within days. Right. If you sort of cut out half your stomach. Right. <laughs> but that is a... And there it affects the microbiome as well. That's, and that's one a of the drastic right. way to do that. But you can actually do the same thing through food. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it in my own clinical painful. practice as well. You know, you, in fact, I warn patients, I'll say, you're going to need to cut your insulin pretty quickly if you yeah. start to do this and really watch for, you know, if low you're giving your sugar. low blood sugar, yeah. right? And here's how you treat low it's blood sugar. It's true. I mean, I, I, you know, we got a lot of, uh, you know, concern from people. And I, and I actually was, was uh, very clear in the book that this is so powerful that you have to make sure that you lower your medications for with sure. your doctor because... If you don't, you can get really in trouble. Low right. blood sugar and low blood pressure can kill you. Right. If it's a little high for a bit or a little, you know, elevated, it's not going to kill you, right? Right. So people are often surprised at how fast their blood sugar and blood pressure comes down when you change your diet. Right. It doesn't take weeks. It takes days. And we, we do it in surgical patients because we know, the, you know, and it, the studies are coming out getting into the nuances of where the A1C is that indicates a, mm -hmm. cl a clear increase in surgical complications. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our goal is to have a good outcome with patients from surgery. And mm. so when I see a patient whose A1C is above 7, we don't, unless they have something that's life-threatening right then, we work to optimize their blood sugar and yeah. get it below that prior to surgery. And I'll have endocrinologists call me and say, you're, you can't, they're, they're as good as they're going to get. Um, and they're not. No. And so, you well, know, that's... I work with them and within days. And so that's the other, you know, sort of fallacy is that you can't see an improvement in an A1C in as period as short as six weeks and you, you can, you can. and if you can. need to measure it you can measure fructosamine to get you know a more finely tuned you know to see what's happening over the past few weeks but yeah. but you can get better results from surgery by optimizing patients by getting their blood sugars down no it's true i see it so much i mean just people have no i mean i had one guy who was very overweight he was on diabetes medications blood pressure medications um in six weeks his uh triglycerides dropped from 300 and something to 65, like 300 points is mm -hmm. HDL, went from 22 to 46, which you never see. Right. And and his um, LDL and his total cholesterol went from 200 to 150. And the, and his blood sugar went from 7.3 hemoglobin C to 5.3, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, in six weeks, it's right. dramatic. And literally he got off his medications, reversed his diabetes, it works so fast. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's my experience with my patients as well. And, you know, we do monitor blood sugars carefully after surgery because the stress of surgery, cortisol, and sometimes patients get mm -hmm. prednisone associated with surgery and, you know, bacteria like sugar. sugar. And, you know, we don't want patients to get post-surgical infections. So that's where really keeping blood sugars. And it drives me crazy when I come in and I see a patient with pancakes on their plate you know, a morning or two after surgery. So, you yeah, know, hospital working, food, we gotta hospital work food, that. that's a whole separate discussion in and of itself. It's true, yeah, no, we, we are still giving patients with heart disease high carb diets, mm -hmm. low fat, high carb diets. I mean, it takes so long from the changes in science till actually they're implemented. So I think it's great that we're having this conversation. I'm so happy to have you here as part of the Fat Summit and co-hosting with me. It's been so much me. fun. And uh, it's just great to be able to just get into this stuff with people and tell the story of what's happening because there's so much misinformation out there. There is.
is, and I think, you know, looking at why this hasn't changed, why the, is people are, you know, all of our medical education was based on eating fat is bad. Yeah. And, totally. you know, it's really ingrained and, you know, unless you're really paying attention to what's going on with the science, then, you know, it's, it's a little bit frightening for some docs to, you know, start to recommend patients are eating their fat unless they have mm -hmm. some personal experience with it or they've really been paying attention to yeah. what's going on with science. And again, it's the science that's out there is confusing too with, you know, looking at the epidemiologic studies versus animal studies versus actual human studies and the metabolic ward studies mm -hmm. and those things. So, yeah. It's, cool. Well, it's thanks fun. for coming, Carrie. Well, thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining the Fat Summit. We'll see you next uh, session.